So the general consensus of this review and breakdown is really going to be all about, first the design and the build quality experiments. We're always gonna start from the outside and work our way in. Pretty much the same playbook routine. Then we're gonna talk about the display experience, right? How has it been using these phones when it comes to the front and center attention of how you interact with the phones, which is of course the display. Then we're gonna be talking about the performance and what our experience has been. And we're gonna be doing some live gaming, of course, as we do with Asphalt, you know how it is. So we're gonna be doing that. Then we're gonna be talking about the camera experience, man. How has the camera experience been? And boy, <laughs> you've seen it today, man. It's gone live back to back of some of the most in-depth camera comparisons you're gonna see on YouTube on any smartphone. And I bet my channel on that. <laughs> so we're gonna go in depth about the camera experience and talk some things about there and how some of the experience is actually better than a pro. Unpopular opinion, but true. We'll skim over software a little bit because again, it is still iOS. So man, what's really different in that retrospect, right? And then we're pretty much gonna be talking about the battery life experience and charging and all the other quality of life features that they've done to this that kind of have surprised me in some retrospect. But without wasting time, let's get into it. So yes, of course, we do have both iPhone 15 series. We do have a guest appearance here with the iPhone 15 Pro in the white titanium. This is the ones that we're rocking with. And I'm going to automatically start of a hot take that's going to surprise everyone in the stream. And it's going to surprise even me still. These iPhone 15 series devices are the nicest physical phones I've ever held, or if not ever held, held in a long time. I want to repeat this so it really sinks in. These are not the nicest feeling iPhones I've ever held. They went from initially being the nicest iPhones I've ever held to feeling like the nicest phones I've ever held, period, period. In fact, let me put the plus on its own for a moment and say this. The Pro is where it's at, of course, right? Titanium subframe with infused aluminium, action button, triple camera, amongst other things that we're gonna discuss and talk about. But, 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 in terms of the actual physical feel, this feels just a bit better than this. To the point where this is the final form of how good an all aluminium or aluminum <laughs> body can feel. These phones feel absolutely gorgeous. This matte finish at the back, wow. At Apple, you knocked it out of the park. This is honestly the nicest physical solid state, non-foldable phones I have physically felt. The matte finish is a dream. The brushed aluminum frame is a dream. The slightly curved contour is a dream. No more shock. This, honestly, best phones I've ever held. I'm so thoroughly impressed by these phones when it comes to handling and build quality, that as an Android fanboy, it makes me almost sick to my stomach that I have to admit, Apple have literally done the biggest justice and upgrade out of all of the four models to the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus when it comes to the design. On a technical level, the pros are more impressive. The fact that they've been brave enough to introduce aluminium, which is a next generation material to be used in a smartphone to the extent that they did. Yes, it's not all aluminium because it is infused with um, aluminium, uh, all, all titanium, sorry. So it is infused with aluminium uh, with a very unique bonding um, um, methodology that they've used on it. But my goodness, as as brands or as a phone manufacturer that has been literally hammering away and using aluminium 
This is the best feeling all metal aluminium phone I've ever held and used. Not for an iPhone, solid state smartphone, period. I've never held and handled phones that felt as good and well put together and as nice as this. And I don't miss my words. I don't take it back. Call me a Samsung fanboy. Call me a Samsung knight. Call me an Android fanboy. I take all of that. But sometimes, 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 surprises come along and praise and praise has to be given. And praise has to be given to the point where the fact I'm actually saying it supersedes the 15 Pro when this on a technical level, because it's using titanium, grade five titanium, says a lot. And I also wanna do another hot take. For every single one of you that's complaining, oh, the colors are not as good as the iPhone XR. The colors are... No one cares your opinion. I love the fact that they've gone for more muted, pastel feeling look to the colors. It sets it apart. Take the mic all you want when it comes to, oh, it's only like different shades of um, white. Who cares? These, are, I just love how subtly done they are. I can't bring myself to put a case on these phones. It's, it's, they feel so good. They feel so good. It would be utterly criminal to put cases on these phones. Yes, still protect your investment. But I've never, never, ever, ever, ever outright held a phone that felt completely good without a case where putting a case on it feels criminal. Putting a case on these phones with how they've done it, with the finishes, how it feels, and the comfort, I, I, I can't do it. Standard procedures in what we're calling in terms of the design and the build quality. Yes, we have now, better late to the party than ever, switched over to USB-C, USB Type-C, right? USB Type-C. Yes, this is 2.0. Yes, 2015 is calling you to get their feature back because we have been experiencing on Android since the Nexus 5X and also the OnePlus 2, as well as obviously with the ill-fated Note 7 from 2016 and beyond, as well as the Google Pixel 1. But it's, it's good to see it. I'm glad it's made a change, but it's nothing to sing home about. Apple, you took your time, and thanks to the European Union, you had to do your work or else it was just gonna be majorly problematic, pro problematic for you. Of course, we've got the side button, as we traditionally know, right? And of course, we've got the two individual volume buttons, which I really like when Apple does that, which is adjacent and symmetrical. And of course, the traditional mute toggle switch, and I hope they keep this design refine it a little bit. Yes, maybe try and make it a bit darker and more saturated, let's just say, and bring the action button because man, once you go action button, can't go back. This is the most on Apple-like addition that has been so clutch and enjoyable to use. But again, we move iPhone 15 plus iPhone 15. Both start at 128 gigabytes. And when it comes to the build and the design, honestly, 10 out of flipping 10. I don't take my words back. And sometimes, as an Android fanboy, as predominantly an Android user, you, I really just have to eat my words. At this point, I sound like an Apple shill, and I sound like an Apple simp. And it's sad that I'm actually making myself sound that way, but I have to be very honest. I'm taken away by the 15 Plus and the 15 more than I am when it comes to the 15 Pro, when it comes to overall design. On a technical level, this is much better but wow, in reality, this, this is special. Let's talk the display. How has the display experience been with both iPhone 15 and 15 Plus? It's taken everything we know and loved or liked about the iPhone, 15, iPhone 14 Pro and iPhone 14 Pro Max display and brought it over with two caveats with one being absolutely major and absolutely, in my opinion, unforgivable for the price point these are coming at. First of all, 6.7 inches, 6.1 inches, diagonal corner to corner, still the same bezel size. And this is something that Apple does well, flat displays, nothing curved to see here, which is easier 
and better for typing, less screen glare, and also easier to apply screen protectors where you need it. The Dynamic Island, of course, we've got the Dynamic Island, which is now part of the Apple experience. This is what we have here when it comes to the Dynamic Island. It's here now. Gone is the old notch since we've experienced it since 2017. All new iPhones that have come out do not have a notch anymore. Long live the Dynamic Island. We're probably going to be putting up with it for another five to seven years. And we get the benefits of it being an OLED display. It's a Retina XDR display. It is high resolution, slightly lower than um, what you call it, 1440p, and slightly higher than 1080p on here. And the biggest benefit that you're getting with the fact that they use the panels from the iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max is brightness levels. And of course, we've got a brightness measurer, and we're going to test the brightness levels to see what we're getting here because Apple's rating this to have 2,000 nits of max peak brightness when it's in automatic mode and outdoor situations, in sunny, bright situations, 1,600 nits for HDR and 1,000 nits sustained. These are the levels that they've quoted, but we know that when it comes to Apple, it's quite high in that retrospect, but you have to be in auto brightness mode to benefit from that. And we're going to test that momentarily. So again, I'm going to stick to my guns and say that I don't like the name Dynamic Island. It is a virtual touch bar because it's virtual and you can touch it to interact with it. It is a virtual touch bar. Dynamic Island is, is just saying the most. Um, explaining it to a normal person will never make sense. But if you say it's a virtual touch bar at the top that you can press and hold and also do stuff with, yeah, it makes more sense in my opinion. No always on display. 800 pounds, 900 pounds starting, 2023, and we don't have an always on display. The most criminal thing though, 60 Hertz. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no. Keep the same energy. Last year, Google released a Pixel 6a. They released a Pixel 6a last year a sub $500, sub $500 pounds. in the UK. It was basically $400 pounds brand new. And Google got torn, not, not like allowed. Google got torn a new one, having a 60 hertz display and a phone that costs no more than $400 pounds. No more than $450. It was being compared to 13 Pro Maxes. Phones that cost more than double the price in how bad the refresh rate was at being at 60 hertz. Somehow, some way, we are okay with Apple still putting 60 hertz displays in here. And at least not a 90 hertz display. No one's asking for an LTPO panel, Apple. No one. No one's asking for that. Heck, no one is even asking for an adaptive panel. Anyone that's gonna come after me, this is my rant moment when it comes to the display experience. You go buy a brand new car, brand new car in today's market, electric, hybrid, or internal combustion engine, brand new, out of the factory. Can anyone tell me, do you need cruise, con do you need cruise control to be able to drive your car? You don't need it. I'm sure the average person, right, would rather have a lot of miles per gallon, aka a brighter display in this situation, than worrying about if my car had cruise control. But that is exactly the principle. You are not going to buy a brand new car at a certain price point in any of today's market, and it wouldn't have a basic function like cruise control. Are people gonna use it? Probably not. The ones that discover it, it's a nice to have um, um, addition that makes long distance driving a less of a pain, but you wouldn't expect to not to be that at that price. In fact, let's measure it up to top speed. 120 Hertz is a measurement of display smoothness and speed. Miles per hour, kilometers per hour, these are measurements of speed, right? The inherent benefit of a high refresh rate is that not only is the display faster, but it's smoother. How would you feel, even though the national speed limit is 70 miles an hour, how would you feel if 
your brand new car, regardless of how efficient or powerful the engine was, was limited to just 60 miles an hour from the manufacturer. Tell me how you'd feel, knowing very well the car and the engine is probably capable of 140 to 150 miles an hour before it tops out. That's the principle of having a 90, a 60, and 120 hertz display at this price point. And people making excuses for this, saying that every single time the average consumer doesn't care. Cool, the average, the average consumer probably doesn't care. Absolutely probably doesn't care. Does not make it acceptable. I'm sorry, I've, I, I cannot bring myself to understand how stingy this display experience is. And it makes me so, so sad. It makes the phone look so jittery and so slow. And I'm sorry, maybe because I've got a trained eye, maybe because I've been used to using a high refresh rate panel from at least 90 Hertz from the OnePlus 7 Pro days from May, 2019. Maybe, maybe I'm the odd tech nerd exception. But by principle, people are keeping these phones for no more than three to five years. Are they subject to actually having this display experience? Yes, I know they're gonna benefit more from having a brighter display. Who wouldn't? It's the principle of someone benefiting from having more miles per gallon in their brand new car. Does not excuse not having cruise control. Does not excuse having a top speed limited to 60 and does not excuse Apple not putting at least a 90 hertz display in here. It detracts from it. And anyone that wants to downplay it because you're gonna make excuses about the, the, the average consumer, you're gonna make excuses about, oh yeah, um, mm, yeah, market research, oh, business purposes, oh yeah, no, it doesn't really matter. You're part of the problem. You are absolutely part of the problem. It's such a level of double standard that every time we have to put them in their own bubble, only Apple can do it. I promise you this down, mark it on the wall. If Apple was still releasing 60 Hertz displays on their non-pro or future ultra phones in 2030, people would still be singing their praises because of business, because the average consumer. It is lazy, I'm sorry, like no, no, no. No, not for me. On the flip side, I can appreciate it ain't gonna be enough to deter this phone from selling like hotcakes. Cause I'm telling you, the brighter display, the quality OLED panel, the dynamic island, the smooth animations, and the overall fit and finish when you hold it and use it, is incredible enough that it makes me so sad. That is what Apple are gonna hide behind. They're gonna hide behind this reason of why not just introduce a 90 hertz display? I, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about the camera later. I'm actually okay with the fact that this doesn't have a triple lens. I'm okay if this doesn't have at least a minimum 3X dedicated zoom. I'm actually okay with that. I'm less okay with somehow how the standards are so different in this situation. 800 pounds, 900 pounds, and you're telling me you can't at least put a 90 hertz display in there? Inexcusable. And it's so sad because it deters away from what is otherwise a top tier display experience. We touch on two key points, which is the design and build quality, the display experience. Let's now get into the performance and what we get with. The performance and experience we get and we're gonna open up Geekbench as a reference and do a benchmark to just kind of set the tone. And then we're gonna do some gaming. Here we have it with the iPhone 15 Plus and iPhone 15. And if we compare it, of course, to what we're having with the 15 Pro, which we'll bring in a moment, we are running the latest iOS 17.0.2. This is using an A16 Pro as found in the iPhone 14 Pro, which I still have in house. We still have six gigabytes of RAM, and we're gonna do a benchmark. And this is using Geekbench 6. Here we are, people. That's the differentiating factor. So slightly higher on the 15 plus. So it goes in a pecking order, as you would expect. 15, 15 plus, 15 Pro. Again, 15 Pro Max should hopefully be here on a Wednesday. So this is the differentiating factor when it comes to the benchmark performance when we are looking at Geekbench 6. 
Again, take this in for reference. Let it just be a reference. It's not completely indicative of real world performance, especially considering these bottles have six gigabytes of RAM compared to eight gigabytes of RAM, which I'm really glad to see Apple up the RAM on this. Better longevity, especially when it comes to software support and running more than one app in the background and task switching or app switching since Apple still don't allow you to do true multitasking. Let's load up some games. Let's go to Ash Fault 9. I'm gonna put a 15 on the side for a moment. We can bring this down up close and personal. So as you can see, the game of performance is pretty much par for the course. It's everything we've come to know from the A16 Pro. Yes, so the A16 Bionic. Yes, this is not the A17 Pro with hardware-based ray tracing. Um, but again, that is such a niche, but yet still brilliant technical feature that we've got in the iPhone 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max. But again, we'll just have to see when those games come out, how those assets will look like and those performance will look like, especially with Metal FX image upscaling technologies that's in there as well. So yeah, I don't think I'll go through absolutely all the motion when it comes to gaming on the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus, but just know that the performance have been more than predictable, more than stellar. Again, it just feels like a detraction based on the fact that the display is 60 Hertz, but away from that, with six gigabytes of RAM and the A17, sorry, the A16 Bionic. Yeah, the performance on these have been really good. The iPhone 15 Plus, as well as the iPhone 15 that we have here, have the same camera system, a new 48 megapixel main sensor and a 12 megapixel ultra wide. These are the two lenses that we're working in. Obviously we've got the same 12 megapixel selfie on the selfie um, for the front facing camera. So that's what we have when it comes to um, the camera system. I just wanna be clear that this is not the same 48 megapixel main camera sensor that we saw on the iPhone 14 Pro and the 14 Pro Max. It's not the same as what's on the 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max. This is a new 48 megapixel sensor bespokely given to the 15 and 15 plus. What, that, what does that basically mean? As an upgrade from the 12 megapixel main sensor on the 14, this is a bigger physical sensor than those 12 megapixel sensors, but it is slightly physically smaller than what you get on the 15 Pro and the 15 Pro Max and the 14 Pro and the 14 Pro Max. It does come with its benefits though. So yes, it's not a 24 millimeter field of view equivalent to full frame is 26 millimeters. So there is a slight, you know, tighter focal length when it comes to the main sensor being 26 millimeters instead of 24 millimeters. But it comes with benefits that I actually, in a lot of way, prefer this main camera sensor over the main camera sensor that you found on the 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max, even though they are physically bit bigger where you can have an effective micron pixel size of 2.44. Um, when it's um, binned, but unbinned is 1.22, whereas obviously this unbinned is one, and then binned is two micron two micron meter effectively. The iPhone 15 series is on the left, and the iPhone uh, and the Galaxy S23 is on the right. Um, video matters to me equally as much as photos, so I put a lot of effort equally. Basically, it's a 50 50 split. Half of it is video, half of it is photos, and I pretty much go into there. And as you can see, all four phones. Again, supplied by Vodafone UK when it comes to the iPhone 15 and 15 Plus, um, have got the same camera systems. It's just the physical size that are smaller. So everything that you see with the Plus model and the normal size, the results are gonna be the same. Um, but when I was doing a camera comparison, I was using the iPhone 15 Plus. So um, one thing I don't like is that on a selfie camera in 4K60, I don't know why, but iPhones still have this problem with dynamic range just being blown out and the highlights being gone. Don't know why Apple still do this. Apple have been doing this since like, my goodness, 2019 when the 11 Pro came out, when it was the first phone that could do 4K 60 on a selfie. Um, but as soon as you go to 4K 30, you see that the issue of dynamic range is, is gone. There's no issue when it comes to dynamic range. So it's, it's weird. Um, but props to Apple, they've been able to incorporate the same benefits that you get when shooting 4K 60 right, where on the same clip, you can switch between the lenses on a rear camera. And that's a level of flexibility that 
only Google offers as well. So Google do that, and I believe Honor do that as well. So being able to switch between all the lenses in 4K60 makes it as usable as um, 4K30. I wish they did allow you to still pause the video and continue recording on the same clip and also flip to the selfie camera, but having much more usable 4K60 where you're able to switch between all the lenses at the back without stopping recording like you have to do on other manufacturers, is a great look, so such a good improvement there. Um, overall, I would say the image quality when it comes to video on iPhone, it's it's better. Um, Samsung looks a bit washed out. Again, I had this in a high bitrate mode to help the Samsung in any way possible. Um, the colors, the rendition of the skin. Yeah, iPhone video is up there. iPhone video is really, really good. Again, the normal numbered ones don't have Pro ProRes and log recording and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, that's that's for um, the benefits of the 17, um, A17 Pro and iPhone 15 Pro series. Um, but yeah, I, I would say video quality, it's a lot clearer. Now, what you do get with Samsung is the ability to, you know, shoot in 8K. So you've got the 8K video option as well. So it's just something to consider. And I think 8K video holds up really well because it's actually usable. And I think Apple do need to consider enabling 8K videos since they've got more than enough horsepower and their video prowess will be so good that we could actually see even better quality 8K video on a smartphone. You've got a video portrait mode. Um, I highly recommend you go watch this in-depth camera comparison, man. I put a lot of effort and work into this one. Um, it's really worth the watch. It's bookmarked so you can get to the sections that you want, but I definitely say, sit down, watch it in 4K60, put some headphones on and watch it at least on your laptop display because that's a bigger display that you can put headphones on. Um, but of course you can watch it on the smartphone as well in 4K60, put your headphones on, full screen it and hear the audio. Um, I pretty much go through everything there. One thing I will say is a lot better on here is the minimum focusing distance. One of the biggest problems with the iPhone 15 Pro is that that main 48 megapixel sensor, the minimum focusing distance is terrible and you need macro mode. But what you have to remember is when you activate macro mode for close shooting, it's not using a main sensor. Macro mode is using an ultra wide and it really drops the quality. So yes, it allows you to really focus close, but a minimum focusing distance on the iPhone 15 series, i.e. the 15 plus and also the 15, is really, really, really good. It's really, really good. Uh, it's it's still not as good as Samsung, but it's so much better than what you have on the 15 Pro um, that I actually like it. I actually like it. I actually like it. And one thing that Apple does really well is, I would say, um, obviously having the different photographic styles. The, f the high resolution mode is a lot more consistent than Samsung's. If we look at this one in this particular situation, HDR kicks in well. There's another situation here where it's me on the rear cameras. And you can see that the HDR performance when you're using a high resolution 50 megapixel mode on the Galaxy S23, is very inconsistent. Compared to Apple, it processes it a lot quicker and it's a lot more consistent in making sure HDR works well. And this is probably down to the smart HDR5. I'll be honest with you, both are not that great when it comes to skin tones. I think iPhone makes me look darker than I am. And this makes me look a little bit more on the red side. But I do prefer the skin tones a lot more on the Samsung, even though both are not perfect. But the overall scenery and the color accuracy of the scene, my jacket, the color of my jacket is way more color accurate on the iPhone. I've got to give it to them. Like, they've done bits. They've done bits. And I'm not too pressed um, that they don't have a dedicated 3x zoom lens, even though, as you can see there, having a dedicated 3x zoom lens for portrait shots, yeah, it's 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 unmatched on the Samsung. So having a dedicated zoom lens is still very useful, but I'm not too pressed that I don't have it. Um, I think overall low light performance is a lot better on Samsung. Like, um, you know, Samsung just does a better job and you're allowed to use more modes in low light, in my opinion. So... If we look at, let's just say in this particular situation with the main wide sensor, you can tell that there is a slight crop on the iPhone, uh, 26 millimeters compared to a wider field of view here at the same distance. So just something to consider in that retrospect. If you look at the ultra wide, this is even, this is not user night mode. And yeah, in low light, 
Yeah, Samsung really, really brought the heat. Like Samsung kind of, especially with night mode being active in portrait mode, portrait mode at low light on iPhone, unless you're going to use the flash, is pretty much useless because with Samsung, look at that. That's with the 3X dedicated zoom lens with night mode and portrait mode, portrait mode put together. Can't do that on an iPhone, not even in a 1X or the 2X. You have to use flash. And as you can see, iPhones do have a strong flash. It's quite overpowering. It, it's, it's, it's the only way to get around it. I would say low light overall, Samsung takes it. But in terms of the actual camera performance, um, it's been an interesting one with the iPhone 15 series. Um, I'm overall actually very pleased. I think there's still some things that can they can do well. Like I said, you know, show the 3X mode. Obviously, the portrait cinematic has a continuous zoom feature there. Obviously, I love what they have here. Um, and I highly recommend you go in and indeed change it to the most most compatible. Um, the, the, the high efficiency codex that Apple's version really adds some form of incompatibility that I really do not enjoy at all. So obviously when you go to your camera, um, go to formats, enable resolution control, the new default mode is 24 megapixels, which is fantastic. Put it to most compatible, right? It's better. Yes, it's going to use up more storage, but it's just better and it's just much more compatible in my opinion. Um, enable the level or the grid, but definitely enable the level. Um, but one thing to definitely consider, especially for us of the darker screen persuasion, photographic styles, right? We might have to consider using different photographic styles to have better skin tones. I might have to do a video on this, like I said, but the standard one, um, it does well for the scene, could do better for skin tones when it comes to, you know, um, people of a darker skin tone like mine. But overall, the camera, I would say that it's been a better experience than I care to admit. And that's good on Apple. That's good on Apple. Would it have been nice to have a dedicated 3X zoom lens? Definitely, 100%. 100%, I think, in general. But it's not entirely on usual. So if you look at Google with their normal numbered series and not their pro device, it is a dual camera. It doesn't have a dedicated zoom. But it does also give prudence and, um, what you call it, credit to Samsung for, um, for allowing the ability to have a dedicated 3X zoom lens on their phones at the price points that they're offering, right? And I think obviously with Samsung inflation hitting them a bit earlier during the year, the base price of their S23 and S23 Free Plus is actually slightly higher than the iPhones by like $50 or 50 pounds. Well, if I look at UK, 50 pounds higher, um, but it shows great value, especially it having 120 Hertz display um, having eight gig gigabytes of RAM, having a dedicated 3X zoom lens. There is there is value in what they're having. Faster charging at 25 watts, faster USB-C at five gigabits per second. Um, there's, there's stuff to consider. There's stuff to consider. But overall, I will say that I prefer the main camera sensor on here, the 48 megapixel camera sensor on here compared to the Pro, even though physically, like I said, the Pro is bigger. Um, and the overall performance of the camera, especially when it comes to video, Got to give it to them, man. Um, color renditions, especially around the scene, very, very impressive. But I highly recommend you watch the ultimate camera comparison, which, are how, which I will have linked in the description below. It will hopefully pop up on the cards above as well. And yeah, in the end cards, I would highly recommend you watch it to get full breakdown and in-depth look of my findings. iOS 17, again, this one is just going to be a quick glance, unfortunately, because I'm not much an iOS software guy. Everything about iOS in itself really still does 100% resonate with me. Um, the lack of multitasking when it comes to being able to use more than one app at the same time on the screen, especially for the Plus model. Um, you know, not being able to arrange your apps the way that you want. Lack of a clipboard. I'm not going to touch too much on software, unfortunately, because I don't want to turn this into an iOS bashing section. Pause, you know, I, I don't want to be doing that. I, I'm just, iOS is too locked down and too basic for me to really enjoy compared to how I use my Android phone, especially on a foldable basis. That's just me being straight. And that's just me being honest. It, it's just, it's iOS. And I know your favorite Apple channels are going to do iOS 17 breakdown and software features and stuff. It's just not me. 
it's just not me. It's um, the best thing about iOS is actually with the iPhone 17 Pro, thanks to the action button and just how customizable it is. Oh man, 120 hertz is so, so smooth, right? This has probably been the best part of iOS that I've really enjoyed, right? Being able to action button straight into the camera app anywhere, even when it's closed, right? That's just been me personally, but that's not a benefit that's on the 15 series. Um, only on a 15 Pro series. So in retrospect, software has been predictable. It's been predictably iOS. So any other new features such as name dropping, all this stuff that happens and, ooh, you know, like, ooh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not fussed. I don't really care. <laughs> so, you know, the software's just been predictable. It's been predictably iOS and iPhone. That's all I can say, people. Apologies. Let's hit the last one and really wrap this up and call my conclusion to this, right? Which has got to be the battery experience. We've had this since Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Three hours of screen on time, as you can see, with lots of battery in there. Great standby time. Obviously, we've not pushed it that heavy um, from that time in. Um, from Sunday, obviously, to today. It's Tuesday now, technically, for me in the UK. This is the day we really pushed it, as you can see. This is when we're really running the camera because we're doing a camera comparison day and night. And it really held well. It really held well in that retrospect, man. So. Battery on the 15 Plus is really up there. I would say best in class out of all of them, rightfully so. Um, you know, I've still not figured out a way to do like a systematic battery drain test video, like how I have a systematic way to real world test the cameras. I would love to still have the energy and the time to do that. But in the meantime, the battery has been really good, especially on the 15 plus so far. Downside is obviously the fact that the, the charging, it's 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 um, it's sad that we can't get iPhones that charge within an hour. You know, it's sad that we can't get iPhones that don't charge within an hour. But again, I guess most people charge overnight. I'm not really one of them. Um, and it's, yeah, that's, that's kind of really been the battery life experience. The battery life experience is really good. Um, still no reverse wireless charging, which is something that you get on the Samsungs with the power share. Um, 20 watts charging compared to 25 watts and 45 and higher. Um, still takes about maybe two hours, an hour and a half slightly over to recharge to 100%. Um, but the battery life itself, in terms of the battery life experience, is really, really strong and really, really good. What's my conclusion? My conclusion is, <sighs> it's 50-50. My conclusion is, I guess for an iPhone user, in all the areas that matter, if you're coming for an iPhone XR and also an iPhone 11, right? This is gonna be an upgrade that you're probably gonna enjoy. It's just a shame that Apple just are relying on their laurels and their fan base and their user base alone. It would be nice for them to have up certain things to help people that are coming over from different platforms that might consider iPhones to switch over. So that's my conclusion. For iPhone users upgrading from the iPhone XR and also the iPhone 11 especially, and even in some cases the iPhone 12, you're gonna love these. You're gonna love these. But for XR users from 2018, this is your time. 